So yes, the goal is to describe some of the use cases for PLV8 and to how you take advantage of it in a web app development environment. Um, so the um, context that I want to use is to frame this around using an existing database model that's it's a normal SQL, but to apply new ideas to how you interact with it versus uh, necessarily focusing on the schema structure, the MongoDB competitor angle of this. I will talk about how that will fit in, um, but the focus is really on um, how you interact um, with, with SQL. So we uh, are going to use a use case um, and uh, just a quick kind of story about how our app got started. Um, it, obviously, you'll have a business they will often um, come up with a new idea. They'll do consulting, uh, and uh, they'll have an industry-specific model where they will, you know, often use uh, their own software tools. Most often, Excel, and they will treat it like software. And they will consult, but then they realize they can't scale with that. They can't, um, you know, uh, consult against two, more than one person at a time. It's not going to work. Um, with large data sets, all sorts of problems. So you go to a real software stack. You, you know, embrace the cloud, the web, you start writing real software. And um, so for our use case, to kind of tie into this Excel to um, web app storyline, we used PLV8 because we had a lot of complex client-side business logic that also needed to be applied to the server. Uh, so an example would be you would do a what-if scenario against a small set of data in the browser, and then you would need to run that against the full set on the client side. And you'd have certain rules about how data interacted and whatnot. And you could also maybe want some logic that uh, um, would be applied to certain rows in a table on the browser, and you might want that same logic to be in, say, your uh, data warehousing tool. Um, to give kind of a visual background and, and, and some bearings, I'll give a quick web app demo. Let me get my mouse. So what this app is, it's an app for human resources departments to model basically salary structures. So there's actually um, 200 out of the Fortune 500 companies are using this app to determine how they pay people. So it's a pretty large amount. Oh, n no, not real data in this one. It's, it's all dummy data. <laughs> it's, <laughs> we have the real data, but not here. <laughs> so. They have programmer data, too. <laughs> um, so what this is, is you have a current structure for how much you're paying people. Um, so basically these grades are salary bands. So you start with kind of entry level and you go up to executives. And so a simple thing you might want to do from one, in, the main focus really here is the midpoint, how much you're paying the median um, executive level person. So what you might do is say, really simply, you might say next year I want to give everyone a 3% raise. And so when you calculate that, what it did was client side wrote some rules that determined how the midpoints changed, um, how the minimums, maximums, and, and you know, range spreads from the quartiles were applied. So it's relatively simple math in this case, and a very small set of data, and so we didn't really want to go to the server. Another example of not wanting to go to the server is let's say we're not paying our executives enough, just definitely not enough money. So we'll bump it up a little bit to start with. And so you can see some other values are changing. And you might want to compare your current against your proposed. And so you can say, here's our current, here's a proposed, and this is you know, the change and everything like that. But you might want to do something that requires a large set of data. So you might want those same calculations, but let's say you want to say, I want to pay everyone at our company what everyone else is paying. And so you might say, and this is a table that's got 40 million rows in it. Um, and so we'll go ahead and calculate this is some dummy data, so it didn't have to hit a whole lot of rows. But it's still pretty quick. And so it goes server side and then runs the same PLV8 functions in a select statement and gets back data. So we keep the logic the same. And switching back 
to the app, we'll show how this works. So we'll just take a small snippet of code, and the question is, how do we get that to work both on the server and on the client um, with shared code? So the first step is I would make a quick recommendation that you develop, you put on your web app, web app developer hat, and you take advantage of an, either an IDE or interactive console.log kind of statements, um, linting your code before you stick the, you know, a PLV8 create function around your code. It's going to be a bit more cumbersome that way. The second step is to just take whatever input or event happens and kind of apply it into both places instead of, um, uh, and, and kind of treat it like an MVC design versus um, trying to use little bits and pieces of your code. You'd rather take a large chunk, because the smaller the amount of code that you're going to share, the more cumbersome it is to just kind of extract out little pieces. To actually run that code, once you stick a create statement around it, you don't want to paste all of your code in one big function. You want to create yourself libraries with sets of functions. So what this basically does is I create a database table with two columns. You create you know, your library name, and uh, you just dump in the code into it. And so you can write you know, um, you know, just in time or um, functions that will just kind of take your, your JavaScript files from your client and just like shove them into the database automatically whenever you save. Um, I use VI. You know, and then you create a quick PLV8 function, and all it really does is grabs it out of the database for a module you give it and runs the magical eval statement. So Douglas Crawford would hate that, but it, it works. And the real trick was a feature added to PLV8. It's the start proc. It's a special little command, and you just pass it your, uh, a single function, then you need to do all your startup functions in there. Then the last piece is you need to actually um, once you've made your calculations and you need to do something that is, is SQL specific, you, you have no reason to leave the PLV8 world uh, just because you, you need to interact with the database. A lot of people coming to PLV8 come from the NoSQL world, and so they want to store everything schemaless. And, and, and so they think, well, I, I'm not going to use PLV8. It doesn't have the, the right indexing support and the things I want to do with it. Or I'll just go back and I'll write another type of function for my SQL. But some people, you can actually write normal SQL, prepared statements. Like we've got large chunks of window clauses inside a common table expressions. You just treat it like normal SQL instead of ever writing PGP SQL again. You don't have that context shift of like my if statements are different. My, where's my close braces and whatnot? They're all, you know, different kinds of code. Um, so there is a point to schemaless. And uh, to use another use case, we had to build a dashboard that was very user customizable. Uh, what that meant was it was multi-tabbed. Users could pick what their axes were and the color schemes and you know the layouts of, of where everything went. And so to re-render that whenever they come back to the page, we had to store all that in the database. And so to get the browser um, all that information, and it needed to be in JSON. And so since there wasn't a whole lot server side we needed to do with it, there was very nice to just store it natively. So there's also native JSON support, and it makes it really convenient when you have little server-side interaction with it. Um, the big thing it also does is it validates your JSON. Uh, if you're not in um, uh, like a Node.js or some other framework that, that automatically is going to do that, and you can write PLV8 functions that will do business level validation. So you must have an x-axis on a chart or something like that. The other thing you can do is you can create indexes. So the way to do this is you will write a PLV8 function that can um, grab, say, the keys out of your um, uh, object. And then you'll uh, return back um, the value for the key. And you can use the functional um, indexing support in Postgres for that. So, so the good in this case with the graph, the idea is to um, 
just store like the x and the y axis because that's you need to know what data to pull out of the database. You'd want to pre-prepare that if you could. But everything else of what color and stuff is not you know you don't need indexes. Um, so I kept this pretty short because I knew Will I cut out some stuff. I knew Will had talked yesterday and uh, um, I figured people were more just looking for some you know. How do I really use this deep other than share a little bit of validation code and everything like that? And also open it to questions. Go ahead. Um, so we, uh, in this one, there's actually really not a whole lot of middle tier. It's, we wrote MVC in the front end. Um, so we had that kind of the controller logic that was there and then the controller logic in PLV, and that kind of is the middle tier that's duplicated or whatnot. Um, I mean, other than the middle tier, you know, from a user authentication and those kinds of things, the, the stuff you don't worry about, it, you know, when you write a new page. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's all the server side does. And so, you, you know, with MVC, there's, there's back base and then there's other frameworks if you're doing something else like that. Yes, yes, you definitely can. And so you can write, you can put both of your functions inside the same function. Like a function contained function, it's just uh, like plain JavaScript at that point. So that it can't, uh, so that the user executing the PLV function can't say get certain columns or query certain data tables. It, it's just going to be like any other, like if you're doing a PGP SQL function, it's the user that's that's running it. So it's user level and role level access in, in Postgres. There's nothing different with that. Well, thanks then. Oh, go ahead. In PLV8 um, or JSON, uh, things that are that don't have a lot of controller logic. If if you what you're doing is really DOM manipulation and you have a very very styled front end, and you have a lot of existing code, say that's it's in Java, you know, you're using Hibernate or something like that. It doesn't really fit in very well if you're not if you don't have a huge amount of code to share. If you're just going to write, you can. If you really like JavaScript, then you can just treat it like a PLPG SQL replacement. But you're not going to, you know, beyond the language, you're not getting much from it.
to this in MongoDB. Um, we actually got more scared of using MongoDB. We, we've just played with it and everything like that, but we've been using Postgres for the last decade, and so the ASA compliance, it just, there was no reason ever to change. And we've got so many existing customers that in, in so much code, ETL code, and you know, things that are just already there that you know, there was no reason to, to get rid of it all for it. And to be honest, I mean, most people think of all the values of the schemas, but most things that people stick in there are pretty, you know, structured data, you know, that people have a customer table, they have an orders table, and then they decide there's a hierarchy, and so it's schemaless. But, I mean, those are pretty well-defined attributes, so you've got a customer name and this and that. So. Yeah, To be honest, I really skip a lot. Other than if it's really simple data, I'm just storing a, a true document. I don't use the JSON. I store, mostly I'll do something like an L tree if I have something hierarchical and I bust it into regular tables. That's a good question, and Heroku is, uh, is willing to sponsor some of those things. <laughs> um, and you could probably talk too about it, but uh, really, and you even mentioned it too, the idea of indexing and getting down and actually you know, traversing it like a tree, the JSON document was indexing. Yep, that's it, that's the missing thing. Will had a selector. There's jQuery, if you're like a front end person, there's jQuery pass selectors that, you know, even without the DOM. Yeah, I'm just switching to the jQuery. <laughs> You don't want to load all of jQuery. You want to grab the sizzle engine, just the selector stuff, not the DOM. But yeah, but that, we have done that. Cool. All right, I think we're done then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.